Fresh, clean water is our Earth's most vital natural resource. Without it, life stops. I'm Corey Adkins. Over the next half hour, you'll meet three men who decided it was time to raise awareness for all the issues around our fresh water. And they don't just talk about it. They sacrifice their bodies and act. This is the look of pain. Freezing, every muscle aches. Physically, everything says quit. Simply standing is hell. But these guys won't give up. They'll stand up, stand up for Great Lakes. But how did they end up here? We love the water. We're here to do something crazy to bring about issues that are affecting our Great Lakes, the ever-growing issues. This lake's pretty important to me, and I think two years ago when we saw it get trashed, we decided we need to do something about it. In 2015, thousands of people trashed Torch Lake after a 4th of July party on the sandbar. Just seeing that one of the most beautiful places I've ever seen and paddled be destroyed by, you know, those cups floating down and the plastic and beer cans, which is it's not what we want people to see when they come here. It's not what we want to see when we paddle. Ever since, they helped clean up. It makes me feel good. It makes me feel like we're actually doing something to make a difference. For many, Line 5 in the Straits of Mackinac is a growing concern. Really, our cause is to raise awareness about what's going on in the Straits. So there's the Line 5 that Enbridge owns, and we want to show facts on both sides. Let's get Enbridge, let's do interviews, let's get them talking. Let's get people that are opposed to it talking. Where do they find, where are these facts coming from? And I think everybody, even Enbridge, can agree that a spill in this location would be the worst place in the world. Bridge looks beautiful, water looks great. So they organized a paddle with two of Quinn's students from Elk Rapids Cherryland Middle School to cross the freezing straits in April, all to keep the conversation going. It showed me I can take on a lot more responsibility than I thought I could. It's, I've seen how many people that this has gotten out to, how many people it's affected. Whether it be a great lake, a river, or even a small pond, their love is clean water. It's kind of what our motto is, stand up for Great Lakes big and small, not just the Great Lakes. And that's why we don't have the in our, you know, our logo, stand up for Great Lakes. So we think all the lakes, especially in Michigan, are great. This time, they're standing up for the largest freshwater preserve in the country the Thunder Bay National Marine Sanctuary. Thunder Bay National Marine Sanctuary is 4,300 square miles of Lake Huron, and, and below those waves is, is an incredible collection of, of the rich history of the Great Lakes. There's about 200 shipwrecks that are hidden below those waves, magnificently preserved by the fresh water of the Great Lakes. When the first European explorers came to this area, they called Lake Huron a freshwater sea. When people started settling and commerce started moving up and down the lake, many would find Huron is just as deadly as the oceans. In the heart of Lake Huron, Thunder Bay, off the shores of Alpena. Back in the late 1800s when there were thousands really of schooners and hundreds of, of steamers it was you know a lot of collisions so a collision course really high traffic like an interstate of, of of traffic here in northwestern lake huron with 200 shipwrecks that one has sank for just about every single reason you can imagine human error fog but but really weather is, is is a big part of it and if you look at the chart of where we are located is there's three things really converge in this area we have the upbound and downbound shipping lanes come together right off of Alpena. Um, we have two weather patterns that collide right in that same area. And then out there, there's a series of islands and reefs that come and all those things happen at one time and it, it helped give this area the name Shipwreck Alley. As a result, 
about a thousand ships litter the bottom of Lake Huron. About 200 of those lie in the Thunder Bay National Marine Sanctuary. These ships are preserved better than anywhere else in the world and it gives us a great way to connect to our past through exploring these sites. Uh, divers, kayakers, snorkelers, even on a glass bottom boat you can go visit these, these wrecks and, and realize how significant this area is. A lot of people, when they think of a sanctuary or an underwater preserve, they think that it is closed off to the public. But our main mission here at Thunder Bay National Marine Sanctuary is to invite people in to experience the Great Lakes and their rich history. We want people out in the sanctuary. We want people out exploring. We have a program right now called Get Into Your Sanctuary, which is encouraging people to, to get out and recreate in the sanctuary. And we feel the more people get out and enjoy this resource, the more they'll want to protect it. You can also learn and explore by walking through the museum in Alpena. So whether it's a shipwreck, a beach, a lighthouse, or their museum, the Friends of the Thunder Bay National Marine Sanctuary want people to enjoy their natural resources. That's when Stephanie Gandula heard about the guys from Stand Up for Great Lakes. I saw on Facebook this team of, of paddlers, Stand Up for Great Lakes, had paddled across Lake Michigan and I thought, wow, well if they can do that, <laughs> maybe they'd like to paddle across Thunder Bay National Marine Sanctuary. So I reached out to them and said, I've got a body of water for you guys to paddle across. Didn't know if they'd take me seriously or not, but had a great conversation with Quinn Morris, and that was a couple years ago, and since then we've just been working really hard to, to make it happen. To put the 90 mile paddle in perspective, this is not doing a marathon. This is like doing a couple of marathons in the, in the same day. I mean, they, what they are gonna try to do in pretty, treacherous waters, again, an area that has been stamped Shipwreck Alley. You don't just hop onto a paddleboard and cross Lake Huron. A lot of planning goes into a trip like this. Two safety boats were needed, along with crew. 287 foot long wooden freighter. And on May 19th, 2017, we all gathered for a safety paddle. We're trying to shoot for the Tobermory region. And so meeting the captains was priority one talking about safety, game planning, where we're launching from, getting them used to our lights, getting them used to our speed and uh, our pace and things like that. A part of it is knowing that the boats are there for emergency situation only. And that's, that's one of those things where, you know, we would like to do it with just us three, because if it's just us three, you gotta make it no matter what. But we all have people that care about us, we all care about other people, so it's kind of, it would just be irresponsible, I think, and uh, selfish to do without the boats. Planning for weather is never easy. That's one of the reasons why Quinn, Joe, and Jeff picked Ryan Matuzak to be the captain. He did Lake Michigan with them and knows the Great Lakes well. Historically, what we found is that the winds would be the best at that mid, midpoint of June historically. So what we were hoping for is um, a day where we had some high pressure and uh, light winds out of the west. With all that in mind, a week in June was set as our window. If the weather patterns didn't set up right between June 13th and the 21st, the trip wouldn't happen. Luckily, the weather god shined down on us, and on June 18th, everybody headed to Alpena. With boards unpacked and nerves high, EMT and firefighter from Alpena, Mike Sanders, took the guy's vitals and talked safety. If you do get hypothermic, it's not the end of the world. There are some things, you know, like increasing your calorie intake, increasing your sugar. I'll probably give you some uh, glucose at that point. I always find it very interesting to watch people, as a paramedic, you know, to watch people uh, kind of dip their toe in the deep end of the pool, so to speak. Great things happen. You see the best of people. It's finally here, two years. Planning for two years and it's here. Nerves right now for sure. The morning was finally here, June 19th, 2017. With the safety boats waiting offshore. Very nervous. Anxious to get going. Good. It was time to go. Don't worry, we'll be alright. Joe will save me. You guys are all See you tomorrow, Joe. Love you. Very proud of you. On the adventure 
of a lifetime. It's so awesome to be able to find a passion and, and be able to do something about it in a big way. Like being able to do something that we love so much is pretty spectacular. Only 90 miles to go. Go get them. The day started picture perfect. It was super nice. It was a little, little windy, but it was a perfect start. When we first started, it was great. I mean, it was we were having fun. It was sunny. We were getting a little bit of a tailwind. Our spirits are really high. I mean, couldn't ask for better weather, better waves, better start with that wind. I mean, it's awesome. And as luck would have it, they got to take one of their first breaks over one of the shipwrecks they're standing up for, the 173-foot Overita. She sank in 1905 because of a fire. It was like 90 feet down, but uh, we could see straight down and we paddled right over that sucker. That was, that was real cool. You know, seeing a shipwreck in Shipwreck Alley, you know, it was amazing. And to be in the National Marine Sanctuary, and we're paddling across it, and it's a lot bigger than it looks like on a map. <laughs> it wasn't just Joe, Jeff, and Quinn having a good time. Elmo and I picked out some lures we thought would probably be fun, and that sure turned into some great entertainment. Uh, the paddlers got to watch us reel in some lake trout. And... Hey, my friend. And the next thing to happen, I swear you couldn't script. We were really trying to get that steelhead bite, and so we got one coming across here on, and the great thing was, I'm hollering to Jeff as Stephanie's trying to reel for us that, hey, the fish is coming because I can see him jumping behind Jeff. The next thing we know, the steelhead jumps right on the board with Jeff. <laughs> Jeff guy, extraordinaire, caught this fish. Look at that. <laughs> oh, man. Looks like a steelhead. Bring that thing here. Bring, steelhead. Bring it in. He's putting it on her stick. <laughs> then, He lost it! <laughs> that was awesome. That couldn't have been. That was fantastic. <laughs> he thought he was going to get rescued, maybe. <laughs> oh, he, got, he was about to get rescued into the grill. <laughs> into her belly. That was a moment everybody will remember, but made the rest of the trip difficult for Jeff. And the fish jumped right on my board, and so the next break, I've got this little seat to sit on, and man, I need to stretch my hip. So I go to sit on that seat and it's covered in fish slime and I slide right off into the water and I only have my dry suit on halfway. So I'm like, like my bottom half is like filled up with water and couldn't get it out. That's when Lake Huron said fun time is over. So here's the deal. We got these ones here and those ones there. They both are legit. It started to rain and I got cold and I sort of struggled for a few hours and I'm thinking man if it gets cold at night and I'm wet this is gonna be rough. It rained for almost five hours. So we got wet it rained and uh, the winds kind of shifted it came at us a little bit northeast a little bit and it was kind of a wash machine for a while and that was kind of the worst part because that's what makes your legs the most tired. When I first got cold, I was, my legs were sort of like kind of wobbly. I was feeling like a baby deer, and I was like, I'm not going to do this for 20 more hours. <laughs> and Quinn, like, Quinn looked over at me one time and started laughing. I go, what? And he said, and you're like wobbly. And I actually got kind of pissed off at him. And uh, <laughs> I said, all right, enough of this. So that's when I went off on my own for a while and mentally got back into it, but also then got warm again. How about this? When's the last time it's going to rain? It'll be later today. <laughs> well, going into the later portions of a day being wet or is a bad situation. Uh, any opportunity to dry off is, is very key. Um, once that sun sets, uh, and you're moist, it's going to get colder out there. We're going to be whatever the temperature of the water is. I'm just trying to time out being able to see if I can dry out before night. Night was coming, and it seemed like the rain wasn't going to stop. Being cold and wet at night could cause hypothermia and end the trip. Then Mother Nature threw them a bone. And then 
we prayed for some dry weather, and that's what happened. The skies opened up. I was so worried about trying to be dry for nighttime that I had my dry suit down to my ankles and was just trying to air everything out. We got some dry weather and we got to dry out. I pulled my dry suit down to about here so my whole upper body could use that wind to, to uh, dry so out. We're sitting here floating around over the deepest part of Lake Huron right now, 730 feet, and at least one of the deepest parts. And then the, the perfect sunset happened. The lake provided them a moment that will forever be seared to their memories. Oh my God, this is awesome. Look at this. I was trying to like live in the moment, you know? It's gonna be over before we know it. We were about halfway through the trip, and I'll be honest, many of us on the safety boats thought the trip would be boring. We were wrong. I didn't know what to expect. I brought a book along to read and things to do because I thought there'd be a lot of downtime, lack of excitement and so forth on this trip, and it was far less than that. I figured by now I'd be twiddling my thumbs, feet up, wondering what to do with myself, and it's been nothing but uh, nonstop action. See the first star! They're all over. Night was now here, the most dangerous part of the trip. But nighttime was a very life and death, serious, serious experience. So we had six hours plus of, of nighttime and making sure those paddlers stayed on their board and making sure we could see their eyes and making sure they, they were safe. Each paddler had a different color scheme of lights so we could tell them apart. Once the sun sets, uh, we have a different protocol and that, that protocol requires us to all maintain contact with one another visually at all times. One of Jeff, Joe, and Quinn's goals of this trip was to do it unassisted. They never wanted to touch the safety boats or take anything from us. But if Ryan or EMT Mike Sanders noticed they are in trouble, they were done. Those hours before the sun come up, they're always the worst, and I knew they were going to be. From the start of the event, I'm looking at body language, and we're having communications between the paddlers and I, and it's pretty much a continuous evaluation of their mental and physical states. I know each one of them, luckily, in, a, in ways that I can tell when they're going to fall. How's your legs? Shaky, but good. Yeah? Yeah. Not going to fall in the drink area. I saw that wobble. Yeah, I've been doing it all day. Yeah, but that was a good one. In that point, too, we'd been paddling for over 12 hours, you know, way over 12 hours. And that's when things start hurting. You can't see really anything but lights. But not a lot of light. They did have the comfort of the blue light from the second safety boat. But other than that, nothing. Imagine being hit from waves you can't see on a paddleboard in the middle of Lake Huron. It just takes a toll on your legs, you know, it's just like, over time, it's just, you're just getting fatigued. Your joints are killing you, you're really cold, and these waves are like knocking you over. After this hour, it'll be 20 hours. On the safety boats, we constantly asked, how you doing? Maybe to an annoying point. You could tell, you could see it. You could see that uh, physically, they were still okay. Mentally, they were starting to uh, draw down a little bit. Sometimes you're just tired. You're tired to the point where you don't want to respond to anything. If you're not doing that great, but you still just need to keep going, since somebody keeps reminding you that you're not doing that great, it could be, you know, like, not demoralizing, but can kind of get you down a little bit. Pretty much this is the one we really got to watch right now. He's going to be a tough guy right now, and I think he is pretty tough. We just need to make sure that he doesn't get outside of our area. Everybody needs to kind of keep an eye on them, just make sure that they don't slip in the dark. And the more waves came and the more that all three of them really looked tired, the more concerned that, that I was for the guys. And I snuck the life ring right next to the seat. The guy didn't let the guys see it, but we had the life ring right there and uh, everybody was in place with uh, dry suits over on the safety boat, our EMT was ready to jump in for a cold water rescue. We never told the guys that, but we were ready. One paddle at a time. That's all I was thinking of, you know, watch the board, 
because I was feeling it too, you know, you get kind of like delusional, you're like staring at the same thing, the same noises, and that's when it becomes important to talk to each other. The night seemed to last forever. At 3 a.m., EMT Mike gave them a little pep talk. Their color was pretty gone at that point. <laughs> so I said, you have to do it. For now and for the rest of your life, this commitment will mean so much to you if you finish it. He basically just pumped us up big time. It was now 4.30 in the morning, and first light cracked the horizon. It was the sign of the long, cold, dangerous night finally being over. It was awesome to see light and be like, all right, the night's over. But I, uh, I thought when we, when as soon as we saw light that we'd see land, and we didn't see land. <laughs> We're in the rain. There's no land in sight. But right now, it's raining. Still no land in sight. Their brotherhood kept them going. By the time we've paddled all day and all night, it's, uh, you just gotta keep going at that point. Then, Lake Huron offers the guys a reward. Like the sunset, the sunrise, we needed that big ball coming up and we did have an awesome rainbow though. It was probably the biggest one I've ever seen in my life. But for everything the lake gives you, she wants something in return. Exhausted, weather beat, and mentally drained. Mistakes can happen. A wave started getting getting heavier, bigger. I had gotten, you know, what I thought was a, a fair distance away from Quinn, and then it's out of nowhere. This big wave just comes and lifts me up, and then sets me gingerly on the back of his board. Uh, all of a sudden, I get this hit from behind, and it like. It was not just a light tap, it was like he must have rolled away and nailed me. And it sent me backward. I landed on my hip on my cooler and I fell off my board and I grabbed it. And I milked it a little bit just to make Joe feel a little bad. And then I got up on the board and hopped up and was laughing about it. It's still something we laugh about to this day. Well, I'd like an explanation. We're playing bumper cars out here. Oh, is that what happened? Land was finally in sight but it never seemed to get closer. Jeff has a saying on his board, do or do not, there is no try. At that point, you just gotta dig down and you know, okay, I, I only need to do this for a little bit longer. And it was a few more hours they had to go. When they were finally in reach of land, it was pouring rain. And now, it wasn't Lake Huron that threw them another problem. It was the Canadian shoreline. Now the terrain is rugged. There was no way to just walk out of there with your equipment. Every bone and muscle in your body wants to be done, and there's land right there. We just looked at each other like, let's finish this. We're here. Let's do it. Nothing could take it away at that point. We were there. They had to paddle two more hours, only being 100 yards from shore. And we're like, man, how much longer? Because we're going right along land, and we're like, where is this Tobermory? Finally, then, when we saw a point, and I saw it, uh, Greg, I saw Quinn's dad standing on that point, and I knew, okay, we're done. And then I like actually started crying at that point because <laughs> I knew we were we were there. Come around the corner and see my dad, and then my mom was just I was tearing up. Let's go, you guys! Just a few more. And then the lake gave them one last present. The skies opened up and the sun shined. An amazing, amazing accomplishment, guys. The superintendent of the Fathom 5 National Marine Park in Canada came out to welcome the guys to the shores of Tobermory. But believe it or not, <laughs> their test of endurance wasn't over. And it was a really cool looking spot, you know, nice scene. And then the first thing I noticed is like, there are all these like rocks, it's like rocks, uneven rocks. And I'm like, I don't think I can stand on this stuff. And uh, there, there's a bench like, 10 feet away and I just go straight for the bench and I sit down and I'm like, oh my God. Man, it was like rocky and we pulled our boards up in there and it was hard to stand up, but it was awesome because I had the American flag and I was like, all right, I can't fall down. You're up to it on it. Congrats, man. <laughs> Made it. Dude. Oh, dude. This is unbelievable. Dude. Made it. A celebration of friends and brothers. 
we got the Canadian flag out and we got the United States flag and it was just one of those moments right there. We hugged each other. Those moments I'll remember forever. On the dock, the tears flowed. Dude, you guys dug worried. so deep. Yeah. You dug so deep. Yeah. Look at those things. Holy cow. Get over here. Thank you. Yeah. Alright. <laughs> <laughs> Emotional thing for all of us to watch. Tough. You guys are tough. I'm telling you. That was tough. In the last 28 hours, Quinn Morris, Jeff Guy, and Joe Lorenz each took about 65,000 paddle strokes. That's the amazing part for me is you know seeing how doing something so basic on the Great Lakes helps people understand the need to you know protect and preserve our freshwater resources. All to stand up for Great Lakes. I don't think I'll do one that long again, ever again. But to look back and say we paddled 90 miles in 28 hours. Not many people can ever say that. They ended up raising $7,000 for the Friends of the Thunder Bay National Marine Sanctuary. For the guys to have dug as deep as they did to do that event for the reasons they're doing it just says a lot about their character and how tough they really are.